20 years after James Earl Ray was convicted, Mr. Pepper sets out to clear him, detailing a case that accuses the FBI, the CIA, the U.S. military, the Memphis police, and local and national organized crime leaders. This talk from the Current Affairs Bookstore in San Diego is an hour and 10 minutes. Um, our speaker this evening is an English barrister and an American lawyer who practices international human rights law from London. He has represented governments and heads of states and appears as an expert on international law issues. A close friend of Dr. Martin Luther King, he also remains to this day a close friend of the King family. He convenes a seminar on international human rights in Oxford, England. So here this evening to talk about his book, An Act of State, The Execution of Martin Luther King, we're very pleased to introduce Mr. William Pepper. Good evening. Thank you for coming and tearing yourselves away from the State of the Union address. <laughs> so much deja vu. Um, let me try to set the tone. Um, this, all of this work of mine started uh, really with Vietnam and Martin King's um, relationship and association with me during the last year of his life was triggered by Vietnam. And, and we tried to just set the tone for the passion that he felt about that war, uh, because it's, I think, uh, very appropriate today. There was a, uh, there was a, a, a poem that moved him uh, uh, very much and very deeply. And some of you may know it. It starts off, uh, I come and stand at every door but no one hears my silent tread. I knock and yet remain unseen, for I am dead. I am dead. I was only seven when I died in Hiroshima long ago. When children die, <clears throat> I was seven then as I am now. When children die, they do not grow. My hair was scorched by swirling flame. My eyes grew dim, my eyes grew blind. Death came and turned my bones to dust, and I was scattered by the wind. All that I ask is but for peace. You fight today. You fight today. So that the children of this world may live and grow and laugh and play. Now, when I came back, I was a freelance journalist, um, I was really as a kid in, in Vietnam. And I came back, um, never published anything when I was there. Uh, had to leave because of where I chose to spend my time when I was in that country and became a, a bit of a, a, a security risk in some ways, I suppose. And um, a, piece, a piece called The Children of Vietnam was included in a, a magazine called Ramparts, which some of you may recall. It was an old progressive mag Ram uh, Ramparts magazine that was published by Warren Hinkle up in San Francisco. On January 1967, it came out, and during that month, Martin King was on his way to um, the West Indies. And he was sitting at the airport in Atlanta with Bernard Lee, his, his uh, bodyguard, and going through his mail. And in that mail was a copy of Ramparts magazine. And his, his food was waiting to be eaten in front of him, and he started scanning through the magazine. And it was, it was the photographs that stopped him. I took um, uh, many photographs when I was, uh, when I was there of, of uh, burned children and shrapnelized uh, uh, civilians, particularly women. And when he saw the photographs, Bernard said he pushed his food away and said, uh, I gave a big sigh. And Bernard said, what's wrong, Martin? The food is no, no good. You're not hungry. And he said, I can never be hungry again. He said, I just can't, Bernard until I do something about this war. This war must end. He had, of course, been opposing it instinctively for a long time, but he now consolidated that opposition. He asked to meet with me, and for the, for the uh, times, the early times that we met, he asked to see other photographs, files, notes I had taken, and I shared them with him. And I remember on the way to, um, to Cambridge from Providence, Rhode Island, where he, had, he delivered a, a sermon, and Brown Chapel, we rode uh, to Cambridge where Vietnam Summer was going to be opened. That was one of the, the anti-war movements, up, uh, organizations up at Harvard. And I 
was going through material with him in the car on the way, and he, it was too much. He just openly wept. And I had become hardened by it because I had, I, I'd been amongst it for a period of time, and I, and, uh, but to him, he, he never, he never could accept that, and he became uh, very emotional about this thing. So then he delivered his speech on uh, the 4th of April, 1967, at Riverside Church. And before he did that, he said to me, he said to me, Bill, will you come down to Ebenezer and will you take the pulpit and will you speak to my people? And <laughs> I thought he'd gone round the bed and I said, Martin, what do you, what do you, do you want a honky from the north to come down? talk to your people? He says, yes, you must come down and talk to them. I said, why? This is silly. They're your people, Martin. You talk to them. You've always talked to them. And he waved his finger. I'll never forget this. He waved his finger in front of me. He says, no. He said, no. You've been there. You've seen it. You must tell them what I have to do. And they'll listen to you. And uh, that <laughs> brought... A uh, uh, loss of words to me, and I, so I went to Ebenezer and spoke to them, and explained why I respectfully thought th their pastor had to oppose this war, which he then did. And the last year of his life, and that was the only year that I knew him, uh, we worked closely together because uh, he was willing to take every uh, opportunity to to organize and to encourage the end of the war. So it was, it was planned to have a um, National Conference for New Politics. It was an umbrella organization. He asked me to lead it and become its director. And um, it was to bring together from all over the country people who uh, were committed to peace and justice. It was a grassroots movement, but it stretched across the socioeconomic range of American society. There were 5,000 delegates that eventually came to the Palmer House in Chicago on Labor Day 1967, and the goal was uh, politically to produce a King-Spock ticket as an alternative to the Johnson uh, uh, administration's re-election. And we were so naive in those days. Uh, Martin Key noted the convention. Um, and as he was speaking, a note was passed to me, and I looked at this note, and it said, get him out of here as soon as he finishes speaking, or we will take him hostage and humiliate him before the world. That note came from a black caucus, which had been formed um, and put together before the convention, but greeted each a uh, member of the black community and black delegations that came in and took them into a separate headquarters in a separate room. Uh, and so there was a tight, uh, unified black caucus. And that note came from the black caucus. We didn't know at the time, of course, that the black, that black caucus had been, uh, consisted of a leadership of, of uh, agents provocateurs who were in the pay of the government of the United States and in the poverty program of Richard Daly in Chicago and included members of the Blackstone Rangers uh, gangs in Chicago. And that the whole idea was to come to this convention and break it up and defeat it. And so what they, what they did was to introduce the most um, extreme resolutions possible and it uh, had the effect of driving away all the funding for that new politics movement. So it was basically over before it began that, that great political movement and, uh, and was fragmented, although it limped along for the course of the year. But as a political movement, it ended. Now, when Martin was killed on April 4, 1968, uh, I went to the memorial. Ben Spock and I went together to the memorial and then to the uh, funeral, funeral service in Atlanta. And Ben and Julian Bond and some others, I think, went up to Bobby Kennedy's suite and, and Bobby had, in, had invited me to, to come up because he, of course, had uh, 
declared for the presidency, uh, and was even flirting with the idea that uh, Martin King might be a, run a running mate for him. Um, I didn't go to Bobby Kennedy's suite. I'd known him some years earlier when I was an even younger person, and um, and uh, didn't like him. I actually handled a campaign of his. I was his citizen's chairman uh, in uh, one of uh, New York State counties. And um, I regret I didn't go now because Bob Kennedy between 1964 and 68, I think, was a very different person. I think he grew in enormous ways. So I couldn't, um, I had had it <laughs> with, uh, with political activity in life, and so I just walked away. Um, did a number of other things. Ten years later, Ralph Abernathy said uh, to me, uh, out of the blue, I want to go and see James Earl Ray. I want you to interrogate him, and I want to watch him and listen to his answers because I have some questions about James Earl Ray's uh, uh, guilt. I said, Ralph, it's ten years later. You, do you ha why do you have these questions now? And and uh, what, what has developed. And I never got a satisfactory answer for that. He said, just do it for me, will you, Bill? So I, I know nothing about the case, I said. I, knew, I had uh, assumed they always had the right man and never gave it a second thought, as you know, and just turned my back. And then if, but if something, if you or Hosea needed you know, an extra body at a demonstration or a march or something, I'm happy to, was happy to, to come along and help. But uh, that was the extent of it. It took several months for me to get it caught up to speed on um, the information about the case and the history of it and the facts, and I did a lot of reading. So we did go uh, five, six months later. It was in August 78. Imagine that, August 1978. First time I saw James Earl Ray, uh, Ralph Abernathy, and uh, a body language specialist from Harvard, who was a psychiatrist who sat in the corner and just watched James' every move as I put him through a rather rigorous interrogation. And of course his lawyer uh, at that time was Mark Lane and, and Mark was present, sat off to the side, and didn't in intervene at all. Well, we came away from that five hour uh, session, uh, Abernathy and I, with a distinct belief that this man was not the shooter. Um, we didn't know what other role he might have played in the killing and we didn't know how, wh what his, what his, whether he was a, uh, whether he was used as a patsy or whether he was a willing uh, conspirator, didn't, didn't have a sense of that. But we had the feeling distinctly he was not the shooter. It came from, uh, it was visceral, but it also was factual. And he was very different, you know. He was very different from the man we had read about and we had heard about. Uh, he was not uh, aggressive. He was not brutish. He wasn't. Uh, didn't have. Didn't appear to have any traces of overt racism. Uh, in fact, he was docile. He was quiet, spoken. He was even shy. Very different kind of person uh, than we had expected. But he raised so many uh, uh, questions in my mind about uh, the official story and his own guilty plea um, uh, scenario that I decided I would start to look into this and see what, what was possible, uh, find out what I could. So I started going into Memphis from time to time and hanging out in South Main Street in the area of the Lorraine Motel and going over into the black sections of, uh, of South Memphis and talking to witnesses meeting people and trying to get a sense of, of the answers to questions that had not been properly asked or answered. And there were a whole range of them. Uh, the, the whole issue of the bushes behind Jim's Grill where Martin, Jim's Grill was a, a cafe that backed onto the Mulberry Street and the Lorraine Motel was there right behind it. And supposedly bushes were cut down in the morning afterward. Well, why were those bushes cut down? And, uh, the, the whole series of whole series of questions about that, like like that 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 arose. So, I started this investigation, and it became a slippery slope, because the deeper I got into it, the more uh, questions I found and I couldn't answer. So I kept going and going, and I kept going back to see uh, to see James O'Reilly, and I kept asking him to clarify to 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 uh, answer new issues that, that I had found, questions. 
And James tried, always to the best of his ability, and he kept asking me to represent him. Um, well, I refused to do that for 10 years. Between 78 and 88, I refused to represent James because I said to him, very frankly, until I'm convinced that you were uh, totally an unknowing patsy and not a knowing conspirator, I'm not going to um, uh, represent you. <laughs> Logistically, I had problems during this time because I was living in England. I was at Cambridge, living in Cambridge for 20, 20 years. I had gone to England, and so I had to keep coming back and forth. I, had, I raised three children at Cambridge, and uh, uh, now, then they were very tiny, which was actually one of the reasons I left. But we, um, I, I made this trip over a period of the 10 years and finally got enough information to convince myself that this man was an unknowing patsy, that he had been used, he'd been manipulated and controlled, he'd been set up. Uh, and so finally, in 1988, I agreed to represent James O'Reilly. And I represented him for the last uh, 10 years of his life. He died in prison in 1998. And uh, we tried to get him a trial um, for all of the period of time and failed. I took his case to the Supreme Court uh, and we, we finally uh, were turned down there only three years after I came on to represent him. And then the idea of a television trial came up. And so in 1992, Thames Television in England and HBO here in the United States sponsored a, a trial, the trial of James Earl Ray. And the judge was Marvin Frankel, uh, old, tough, old, former federal judge. Prosecutor was uh, Hickman Ewing Jr. Um, name may ring a bell with you because he was Ken Starr's number two for a period of time on the Whitewater uh, investigation. And he's a former U.S. attorney. So Hickman prosecuted, I defended, uh, and we went at it uh, strictly under Tennessee uh, criminal code, uh, adhering strictly to that code. Um, jury came from all over the country, so it wasn't a local jury, and, they, and we screened them. We went through the usual uh, exclusion uh, process. Took the jury seven hours. After 10 days of trial, took them seven hours to find James Earl Ray not guilty with a fraction of the evidence that um, was to emerge over the last 10 years. So, probably never heard about that, or few of you may have heard about it, because it was never reported, it was never covered, the media uh, never uh, treated it in, in any way at all as a news story. It was regarded as entertainment, and even then it was not it was not covered. And this has been the history of this case and it's in the investigation and the results is that there is an embargo in the United States with respect to this story. The book, the first book written in 1995, Orders to Kill, was never reviewed in America. This book will not be reviewed in America. So when it comes to those kinds of, uh, of national security issues, very sensitive issues, it's very difficult to get the story out in the mainstream. Um, after the trial, the television trial, witnesses started to come forward. Pieces, other pieces started to be put in place. Um, a man called Lloyd Jowers was suddenly cast into the frame. He was the manager of Jim's Grill. I had found four witnesses, finally, independently, who implicated Jowers in the killing of Martin Luther King. Jowers knew about this and decided he was going to be indicted and asked his lawyer to go and get him immunity from prosecution and he would then tell everything. So his lawyer goes trotting over to the district attorney general's office and says, you know, I represent Mr. Lloyd Jowers and uh, he's very much involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King, but he knows everything that happened around his premises where it was planned and who was involved locally, and he's prepared to give you all that information, but all he needs is immunity. Well, not only did Jowers not get immunity from prosecution, but he uh, was never interviewed by the uh, District Attorney General. Jowers was still frightened, so he tried to push the envelope a little bit, and um, he 
was able to appear on a, an ABC program called Primetime Live. It's uh, run by a fellow called Sam Donaldson, who is a, a peculiarly independent guy uh, 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 in terms of that program. Jowers told his story about how he was approached by a local produce man named Frank Liberto, who was a member of the Marcello family, the Marcello family organization. He worked for them. He was one of, one of, their, one of their guys, their lieutenants in Memphis. And Liberto uh, offered him $100,000 and um, called in a big due bill he had, a big debt. I later found out what that debt was. And um, in exchange for that, Jowers was going to do everything he was told, and he was going to allow his facilities to be used for the planning, the staging of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And Jowers agreed, and he went along with it. And uh, I cover his, his whole role. And eventually, of course, Lloyd Jowers has told everything uh, to Dexter King and myself, to Andrew Young and Dexter King separately. Um, and he admitted uh, the... The, the scope of his involvement in this conspiracy. So we now had the Marcello organization pretty clearly in the frame, and it was looking like a contract killing. A contract killing uh, carried out by a Memphis Police Department officer who was paid uh, to do it. So. We moved beyond Jowers to reach out to other witnesses who came forward. And one of them told us about living in Houston, Texas, and knowing a fellow called Raul, uh, and becoming friendly with Raul and his cousin Armando, and going to the docks in Houston and taking boxes of weapons and helping transport them to a house where they were repackaged and apparently sent into South America. Uh, for uh, a profit-making operation. And she didn't know where the weapons came from or anything, but she knew about this operation. And she told a horror story one time. She said she was at the house where she was uh, uh, lo unloading these weapons, and she put her key chain on the, on the uh, uh, kitchen table where they were around where they, uh, they were sitting, and one of the guys picked it up and looked at it, and it had the photographs in the, uh, in the little plastic circle of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And he looked at this, and then he threw it to Raoul. And Raoul grabbed it, and looked at it, and became, she said, totally furious, threw it on the floor, jumped up, stamped on it, and said, that I killed that nigger once. Looks as though I'm going to have to do it again. Pulled out a gun and grabbed Glenda, who had known this man uh, for quite a period of time, and took her into a, a bedroom off the kitchen and raped her. And she was totally uh, uh, frightened, appalled, and didn't know what this was all about. But it obviously led her to believe quite f clearly that this man had some involvement in the killing of Martin King. And she set this whole story out. She didn't tell anybody about this for many years. You have to understand, one of the, th the reasons that this case has now come to the point where it's effectively solved is that somehow it, people have become willing to come forward after many years and talk. The first witness to implicate Lloyd Jowers, Betty Spates, um, knew what happened in 1968 and didn't tell it to me until 1992. And I had known Betty f since 1978, though Lloyd had tried to keep me away from her, which made me more and more suspicious. But what actually happened with Betty was she had an affair with Lloyd. And she had tried to keep an eye on him. And she thought that Thursday afternoon that when he wasn't in the grill that maybe he was out fooling around in the bushes with one of the, uh, the, the, uh, the ladies of the night who used to hang out there uh, around the motel. Because the motel in those days was also a, what we call a hot sheet place, I suppose it was used for, uh, for those kinds of uh, dalliances. So she said, well, I didn't see him, so I decided I was going to go look and, and, and find him. And, and she found the door to the kitchen closed, which was unusual. And then she found the back door open, which was uh, also unusual. And as she got to the back door and started to look out, 
just before she looked out, she heard a shot. And then as she looked out, she saw Lloyd coming running straight from the bushes toward her, carrying a still smoking rifle. He brushed past her, came inside, broke it down. And as he broke it down, he looked at her and he said, you wouldn't ever do anything to hurt me, would you? And she said, no, Lloyd, you know, of course I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. He said, good. And then he took a shell and threw it into the, the, the commode, the toilet in the back you know, of the kitchen there, and tried to flush it and it stopped up the toilet. It gave him a problem that he had to deal with. Um, but he took the gun then out and put it under the counter where it, where it remained. Well, Betty was terrified. She, she kept this to herself because she knew Lloyd, she would believed Lloyd killed Martin Luther King. She didn't know he'd taken the gun from the shooter. She thought he had actually done it. So she kept this to herself all, all those years, afraid. And once she said he did send someone to try to kill her, but it was more likely it was just going to intimidate her, not, uh, not to kill her. So it's taken a long time for much of this evidence to come out. Uh, after the television trial, there appeared in the Memphis Commercial Appeal an article, long article by a, a writer named Steve Tompkins. Um, Steve had spent a, a year and a half researching the infiltration, surveillance, and monitoring of um, black um, civil rights leaders and black community activists and black community leaders. Uh, he spent a year and a half investigating the infiltration and the monitoring of these leaders uh, by uh, army intelligence. And he came to learn that this, this was a prog there was a program of surveillance of, uh, of particularly black uh, leaders uh, after the, second, in the sec end of the second decade of the 20th century because of the fear uh, that the Russian Revolution um, was going to come to American soil and its prime recruiting uh, warriors might well be discontented black m minority citizens. So they kept them the leaders under surveillance for a long time. So the Quantel Pro in the, in the 60s, 50s and 60s is something that's not, uh, uh, not, not uh, unusual, has historical precedent. In the course of that whole article, which dealt then with, with modern surveillance of King and the wiretapping and all of that, his movements, there was a tiny little paragraph that said, and in Memphis, Tennessee on the 4th of April, 1968, there was an, an Alpha 184 team, a six-man Alpha 184 team. And he said, and no one has ever explained what that team was doing there. So I went to see Steve, and this was the first time I'd ever heard of any possible involvement of, of uh, anyone other than the Mafia in terms of the killing of King. So I went to see Steve, and I asked him to help me, because James was in prison, we were trying to get him a trial, and, and he refused. He said, no, these are very bad people, the worst 18 months of my life, I don't want anything to do with it. And I just kept going back to him, kept being a bit persistent, and finally said, yes, okay, I will, uh, I'll help you. And then for quite a period of time, the, the arrangement was I would give him questions. He knew nothing about the assassination, the details of it. I'd give him questions, and he would go to two of his contacts were members of that team, give them the questions. They agreed they would answer them, and he would bring them back, and we, we went on this route. They would never meet with me because I was James's lawyer, and they lived in Mexico. They had fled in the 70s because they thought a cleanup operation was on, so Steve made these trips all the time. And a picture started to emerge which indicated that there was an official involvement, although the killing was, in fact, uh, a, a, a mafia contract killing, that there was an official involvement and there was coordination, and there were two photographers on the um, roof of the fire station, uh, which was diagonally across the street from the uh, Lorraine, who photographed everything. So we now learned that there are photographs of the assassination of Martin King, including a photograph of the assassin. And we made, again through Steve, contact with both photographers. One lives in Costa Rica. And um, eventually, we, ne we nego tried to negotiate the acquisition of those photographs, and eventually they broke down because at one point uh, there was a security breach, and Steve was followed on a, to a critical meeting, 
and uh, by two uh, uh, FBI agents of a local field office in Miami. And they, one of them stuck a long lens out the passenger side of the car and just spooked the, uh, the photographer who took off. And that ended those negotiations. We, we did file a Freedom of Information Act suit, or, or colleagues of mine did, and uh, it was denied that the photographs uh, ever existed. So the, uh, this kind of evidence began to pile up. And in 1995, I published where we were in terms of the, the state of the information at that point in time and in, in a book called Orders to Kill. This work, Act of State, is the end of the story in terms of, of uh, the assassination of Martin King, so far as we are concerned. In 1999, we tried a civil case against Lloyd Jowers and other conspirators, known and unknown. <coughs> you probably never heard of that trial either. Uh, that trial took place because the King family decided around 96, after carefully considering it and being somewhat aware of my work over the years, that it was time to try to get a trial for James O. Ray because he was, he was dying of liver disease. And so the King family came out in favor of a trial for James, and there was a fair amount of publicity about that, so people probably know that. Um, and um, that failed because James died. We could have kept him alive. I had negotiated a liver transplant position for him at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, I put in an application to the court to allow him to be uh, transferred, transported to the University of Pittsburgh where the operation would take place. He qualified. He, had all, he, he met all of their criteria. And uh, we offered to pay all the expenses, of course. And uh, we were denied permission he was denied the, the liver transplant that he needed to live. So he died in 1998. And I guess we figured, well, this is the end of the road, isn't it? What do we, what do, we do now? And I met with the family in, at length, and um, I said, there is, they said, do we have any options? Said, There's only one option, and that is we could sue Lloyd Jowers. We have enough evidence to get a lawsuit going against him and to bring him to court and sue him on... Uh, on a, a civil case, wrongful, wrongful death charge. So we did that. We filed it. And about a year after filing, in 98, a year after filing, the case came up. And it came up before the judge that we wanted it to come before, a man called Swearingen, a black judge, one of the few independent judges in that judicial system, who was going to retire shortly. In fact, this became his last case. So Judge Swearingen heard the case. We started um, to try it on a, uh, November 10th, I guess it was. We tried this case for 30 days. 70 witnesses proceeded to, that, uh, uh, to t testify under oath. 70 witnesses over 30 days. And it took a jury 59 minutes to find for the King family against Lloyd Jowers and other conspirators known and unknown. And the whole, all of the evidence gathered, finally under oath, is uh, on the website of the King Center, the kingcenter.com. 4,000 pages of testimony. Uh, and so there is that historical record, which doesn't do James any good, but at least it laid out the, the whole scenario of the case. And it, and it dealt with all of the nuances, all of the evidence, which is uh, I can, I, maybe too much to go into uh, here, but we can talk, I can answer questions if you want. But it included evidence of two eyewitnesses who saw James O'Reilly driving away from the scene 20 minutes before the killing, as he always had said he'd done. Uh, evidence about the weapon, which was not the throw-down gun, which was not the weapon. Evidence about the existence of Raoul. Raoul exists. He's alive and well. Uh, and um, f four different independent identifications of Raoul from a photograph that a, 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 a um, inside intelligence agent uh, ki kindly provided quietly to me. Um, and this was a photograph that James O'Reilly saw in 1978 and identified. In 1978, 
And there were two newspaper articles that said James O'Reilly has identified, he's finally, after seeing hundreds, has identified a photograph of the man he claims controlled him, Raul. Well, on the back of that photograph was a name. This had been sent anonymously, anonymously to James, and there was a name on the back of the photograph, and the name was the name of someone else. So obviously, this in 78 was the time of the select committee hearings, the congressional hearings. What they hoped would happen was James would see this photograph, say, yes, that's Raul, and then look on the back, well, and this is his real name, and then have a press conference and, and announce that, and of course, then they'd blow him out of the water, and his credibility would be gone. But he didn't do that. He didn't take the name, he just simply said, this is the photograph. And so I showed it to him, when I showed it to him in 95, 96, he said, yes, that's the same one that I identified then. This is Raul. English merchant seamen identified him as being in the same bar up in uh, Montreal where James said he always said he met him. See? So one after another, his own daughter, when confronted at the door with the photograph, said, well, anybody could get that photograph of my father. So she identified the photograph as that of her father. Glenda Grabo identified this as the man who raped her. Not only that, she called him on the telephone and spoke with him uh, for nine minutes and we talked about old times. So he's alive and well, but when he knew we were on to him, all of a sudden government agents appeared at his house and a Portuguese reporter who interviewed his wife was amazed to find her saying, this has been hell for us. But you know, the government of the United States has, has been so kind and so good. They send these people in who tell us how to answer questions. They, they tap our phones. They, they've done such wonderful things for us. Now, this is a retired assembly line automobile worker. All right? And why would, he, why would the government be doing all these things for this man? So, I mean, the, the, the evidence mounts and goes on and on, and it's, um, uh, the case is, is pretty clear. The facts are pretty clear at this point. Memphis Police Department officers who are involved were pretty clear. It's also pretty clear that no one wants to prosecute uh, and has ever wanted to prosecute, and that the official story has been defended by publicists forever. And the Attorney General of the United States did a report following the trial, which again confirmed the, uh, the official story. <clears throat> the family wanted a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, Clint, President Clinton uh, turned it over to his Attorney General, and the story has, has maintained itself uh, ever since. But I think, um, for me, one of the most important aspects of this book, uh, Orders to Kill, is not the, s the solution to the murder of Martin Luther King and who killed him. Um, it's one of the lessons that we can draw from this type of government activity uh, against a man who became intolerable. And he was intolerable, not only because he opposed the war in Vietnam, but more because he was going to bring a half million of the most wretched of our citizens to Washington to camp there, to live there in a tent city and go every day up the hill to see their congressmen and their representatives and try to get put back into the budget social programs which had been taken out. And they were going to go up and come back and go up and come back. And the, the, the forces, the security law enforcement, intelligence forces in, the, in, in, in position in government were convinced that Martin King would lose control of that group that they would become so angry as they became uh, rebuffed that they would become violent and they would become a revolutionary force and they didn't have enough troops to put down that revolution. Westmoreland wanted 200,000, they couldn't give them to him. They didn't have the troops, they couldn't do it. So Martin King was never going to be allowed to go to Memphis, from Memphis to Washington. He was, he was going to finish there. His room was changed from a lower courtyard room to a ba exposed balcony room. Um, he was well and truly uh, set up, had virtually no security at all. Didn't think about that in those days. His rooms were monitored and wired in, in the hotel, as with one on either side of him. Um, he was a sitting duck. And uh, the story that came back from these two officers uh, was that they were briefed at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, 
At 4.30 in the morning of April 4th, they were shown two photographs, one of Martin King and one of Andrew Young. And these were the two targets that the snipers and their spotters had in their crosshairs. At the time, the shot came from the bushes. Each one thought the other did it. When they found out it was some what they call wacko civilian later on, they were, they were nonplussed. They didn't know what, what, had, uh, what had happened. They were the, really only a backup operation there. Next morning early, the bushes were cut down. Deputy uh, Public Works Director testified under oath, yeah, I was called and I was asked to send a team in there to help the police, and it was a crime scene. So I said, you sanitized it? He said, yeah, well, they just told us what to do. Our people just cut down all the bushes and cleaned it, so no, there were no traces of anything anymore. Uh, so, well and truly covered up has been this assassination. But it's important for Americans to understand as, and not only Americans, because this happens, this happens throughout the history and throughout the world, but this is our country, this is our time, and it's important to understand that these things have happened and do continue to happen and, and will continue to happen, uh, perhaps unless there is an aware citizenry to do something about it. The second most important aspect of, of, of this work, in my view, is, is a chapter that deals with the roots of Martin Luther King. Because when you, when you understand where he came from, and the kind of person he was. You, you also understand uh, what a great loss this has been. A loss that has been irreplaceable for all of these years and how he is missed. And his real mentor, historically, was not Gandhi. Gandhi was his tactical mentor in terms of nonviolence, but his real mentor was John Ruskin, the Victorian British political economist who was so committed uh, to the redistribution of wealth and the provision of economic assistance to the, the least well-off in any society, that he waged uh, uh, campaigns in, uh, everywhere he could in England, even though he was known as the greatest art, art uh, historian and art critic of his day, Ruskin had this enormous feeling for the poor and what had to be done for a humane, in a humane society how they could not be neglected. So Martin's roots go back to Ruskin. And if we were, we can take him further back, uh, even into classical times. He believed that, um, you know, we should take this neighborhood that we have built uh, technologically, now electronically, and we should make it into a brotherhood. But he didn't see us going that way. He saw us using he quoted Thoreau off. He saw us using unimproved means, improved means to reach unimproved ends. And uh, he was horrified at the evil of war, racism, and injustice, and would not compromise, lost great sums of money in the, because of this commitment. The the motto that I, I chosen for the seminar I convened at Oxford University is non nobis solum nati sumus, which is a uh, Latin phrase which says, we exist not for ourselves alone. One of Martin's favorite poets was John Donne, who wrote that famous poem, No Man is an Island. And the least, uh, the least of any person on earth who is harmed or hurt is a harm injury to myself. That was the philosophy of Martin King, and um, he lived it to the end, and he was committed uh, to the end to accomplishing those goals. And uh, he died in the process. Okay, thank you. I'm glad to answer any questions or, that you have. Yes. Um, I was once talking with a crime writer, a detective writer, and he said that he was tracing out James Earl Ray's brothers, mm -hmm. um, and he thought there'd be some evidence or something there. Did you ever talk with the brothers or know much about that, that story? I, I, I know the brothers, of course. Um, well, I don't know John. No one. I mean, John is a very uh, erratic chap. Uh, so I don't. I don't. I, he's been out of the picture. So I don't really know him. But of course, I've known Jerry Ray for almost all of the time. Yes, and Jerry was always very supportive of his brother, and very loving toward James, and did everything he could to help him.
but uh, Jerry um, knew very little. When James escaped from prison, he made his way to Canada. He wasn't interested in staying in the United States at all. He was trying to get out of North America. And that's where he was in Montreal when he met Raoul, who talked him into working for him part time. Um, but Jerry was, uh, I believe, kept very, very largely in the dark of, of these things. Yeah. Yes. Well, it sort of smacks the Kennedy assassination a little bit, doesn't it? But anyway, uh, my question is, what did, what did uh, uh, James Earl Ray think, or what did yeah? He, I'm sure, had some ideas about who actually did kill Martin Luther King, and and I would be curious to find out what and who you think actually did it. Who who dropped the dime and got the mafia involved? I know the government uses the mafia in many many circumstances. Do you have any thoughts about it? I'm sure you do. Yeah, well, there are a couple of there are a couple yeah, of questions yeah, there. Absolutely. Um, There's a book uh, there, but you know, yeah. <laughs> well, well um, James. In, in that kind of situation, in the situation in which he was, James would know only what he uh, needed to know in order to do what he had to do. And so as a result, he was told very little. Remember, he was an escaped convict on the run. And he was in a position where he could ask questions. This guy was feeding him money, keeping him going, bought him a car. So he would be told what he, was needed, what he needed to know. N nothing, nothing like that. And, and, and he, was, he was moved around and he did things. Okay. So that... Uh, and I'm sure that happens in many, many instances, right? Um, with respect to um, uh, dropping the dime, or, as you put it, or who killed Martin Luther King, um, when the decision was taken to kill King, um, in my view, the coordination was put in the hands of a little-known um, military intelligence group that is housed in the bowels of the Pentagon. And that group... Uh, under its under its colonel, organized a, effectively a task force operation. That group was also involved in a joint venture with the Marcello organization. Absolutely. The guns were stolen, that were sold, were stolen from our military bases and arsenals and forts. They were trucked into Marcello's organization, come around to be taken off at Houston. The, the profits, as I was told, were, sold, were split 50-50. So there was a joint venture relationship between them. But more than that, James Earl Ray's alias was not an alias, it was an identity. He was given an actual identity of a man called Eric Galt. Eric Galt um, had high national security clearance in the United States. He was the warehouseman at uh, Union Carbide's plant in Canada, outside of Toronto. The this military intelligence group in the Pentagon was working with him on an various operations at the, the, this very time. James was given this man's identity. Why would he be given this man's identity? Well, we can only surmise that. And probably because if he was ever stopped, and James is clumsy, and he made mistakes, and that's how he ended up in prison. No. Uh, he was often too late for a robbery he was going to pull. <laughs> I mean that. The safe would be locked. <laughs> and they say, there's a time lock on the safe, James. We'll give you our money. <laughs> you know, you know, James said, I don't want your money. I want that. No, the safe is locked. This happened to James. He, was, he ended up being late. He was clumsy, only carried five bullets in his pistol. He, once he, he admitted to me with embarrassment that he kept the firing pin chamber empty because he shot himself in the foot once. <laughs> so he said, I cannot do that. I didn't have a bullet in there. You know. And so... Uh, when the prosecutor at the television trial said to him, what would you do? You say you couldn't kill anybody? You've never killed anybody? He said, no. He said, I used to shoot squirrels when I was a kid with my father's 22. He said, well, you couldn't kill anybody? What would you do if you came into my store and you pointed a gun at me and I pulled a gun from the gun and I pointed my gun at you? What would you do? You wouldn't shoot me? He said, I'd say let's make a deal. <laughs> I mean, this is the nature of this, of, of this guy. Um, so uh, he was very much given that identity so if he was ever stopped, uh, it, it, they, when they ran a check on him, he would, they would be told to let him, uh, let him go. Much like a husband. Well, I, I did, I've not gotten into any investigation of any other assassinations. I had my hands full with this one and a man in prison, yes. Can, can we hear some of the details of the denial of the liver transplant? Well, it was, uh, it was unprecedented. Um, 
It had never been done. Uh, he didn't have a right under law. The commissioner of the Department of Corrections did not have the statutory authority to allow it to happen. I mean, there's the, a the whole range of a whole range of specious reasons that uh, that they used. Um, just like they took jo Judge Joe Brown off the case on the eve he was about to grant us a trial. They took Joe Brown off and did it without allowing oral argument before the Court of Appeal in Tennessee. They took him off. Just in the night that decision was made. Yes? There's been speculation over the years about the possible involvement of J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, what do you think about that? Yes, the FBI's role in the uh, killing of Martin Luther King was, in my view, to cover it up. And their role was the, was the cover-up. They took control of the investigation and basically uh, perpetuated the cover-up. Uh, Mr. Hoover sent one of his personal agents, best agents, as a liaison uh, to a senior military officer uh, um, in the intelligence wing. And that man kept going back and forth and back and forth. He effectively seconded this man. And um, he knew everything that was going on. He was not involved in the on-the-ground details and the organization of those details at all, in my view. But he then controlled the, in, uh, the investigation. So then you're saying that you don't think it started with, with Jay Edgar? No, I don't think it started with Hoover. But I think he concurred. And I think he believed from the outset that the only way uh, that Martin King could be uh, dealt with effectively was to be killed. And he said that more than once to a friend of his, H.L. Hunt, an oil man. And I had witnesses who used to, uh, Hunt's administrative assistant, um, used to be present at a number of those, those meetings between Hoover and Hunt. And Hunt used to have a private line phone in his desk just, just to Hoover. And Hoover gave Hunt his, his the director of security. So they were very close. And Hunt used to think, well, we can stop King by my lifeline programs. He had a program that he used to broadcast. And Hoover would give him scurrilous material, and Hunt would put it out on the air. And, and, and so Hunt thought this was going to do it, and Hoover said, that's not going to do it. We've got to take other, other steps. Let me just go to something else. Yes? Given all that you've heard over the years about this and, and all that you've realized about the state of mind of our government, where has that left you personally, philosophically, and what lessons have you learned? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's um, I've learned to be uh, I've learned to be cynical and skeptical. Uh, I'm a first generation American. My parents uh, emigrated here from uh, Ireland, and I grew up as uh, as a as a as a kid believing everything that one is taught in school. The American dream. Yeah, the American dream kind of thing. I, my life was a little different in that when I was 12, I was a baseball player. I mean, I, I played baseball in, at Columbia, and I was a, I was a ball player, and basketball and baseball. And then, but when I was 12, I loved that game so much that I wanted to play all summer. And I lived in a middle-class neighborhood, and the kids wouldn't play. So the only way I could play was I'd, I'd take my brown sandwich bag, and I'd go into across town on a trolley car into the ghetto. And I, I would play there all day with, uh, with black kids. So. I had an advantage that a lot of white middle class kids didn't have because I s began to see how people lived. And I began to wonder why they lived like this. You know, I remember seeing Herbie throw his shoe at a rat that ran across the living room floor. And I'd never seen a rat in the living room before. <laughs> you know, so I, I, the whole, that was, so I had, I had, I regard that as an advantage. Not only for my skills as a, as a ball player, but for my growth as a, as a human being. So I think you, you have to, <clears throat> become, when you go through these kinds of experiences, you have to become skeptical. And uh, you have to question everything. And have no illusions about uh, power. And I, um, I now am um, very unhappy to see the course that this uh, empire is taking, because it is an empirical force, no question about it. And I see a lot of the same. You remember Rome was a republic first. Yeah. And it's went into uh, empirical Amen. room. And so we see a lot of the same, a lot of the same. So I think citizens have to be alert. They have to, more than anything, you have to teach your children. Teach your children. 
teach your children to question because long after we're all gone, we, know, we must have them teach their children. And this, otherwise, this oral tradition will, will be useless. Yes? Um, how do you feel about today's political leaders representing the legacy of uh, Martin Luther King? Political? I'm sorry, I didn't... How do you feel about today's leaders uh, representing the legacy of uh, Martin King? Well, it's politically uh, opportunistic, isn't it? I mean, it's, um, it's useful for them to do it. Um, anyone who can ride on the legacy bandwagon of Martin King uh, is going to do it. Uh, people who hated him and had disdain for him when he was alive. Civil rights leaders, you know, walked away from him when he was alive. He called me very late at night after Riverside speech and said, you know, they're all gone now. They've all told me not to do this. All my brothers, my friends have told me this. So we got to build this new team because they're all gone. This is not the thing to do to attack this, uh, this government. So, you know, I, I almost um, became ill one time when we, we were arguing at, at a parole hearing for James and the prosecutor, district attorney general, attended. And he went on about how much this nation had lost when Martin King was killed. You know, and I knew the man's roots. <laughs> and, uh, um, but that's what politicians and political figures do, isn't it? And so we have to learn to understand, yes. As a close friend of um, Dr. King, uh, what do you think, if he was around today, his involvement, if any, would be with the current anti-war movement against the war in Iraq? And what do you expect that he'd say to us as citizens what our duty should be? as Americans? Well, I don't have any doubt if he were around today, he would be um, very much uh, active in the leadership against uh, the Iraqi adventure. And he would work in every way he possibly could, you know, to, um, to stop that war or to prevent it from happening or to preempt it or discontinue it once it started because he would know um, what the results would be. And we all should know what the results would be. We're going to once again witness the slaughter of thousands upon thousands of innocents. Before there is ever any military engagement, there will be an engagement of our military with the civilians of, the, of Iraq. Once more, an ancient, an ancient civilization, irrespective of its leadership, an ancient civilization and people is what we're talking about here. You know, the Sumerians, the ancient civilization of Samaria 6,000 years ago, had its roots in the, in the southern part of Iraq. Babylon is Iraq. So uh, we're about to destroy not only a people, live, warm, breathing human beings of tender ages, mostly, who are the most vulnerable, uh, but we're going to remake and restructure an ancient civilization's symbols and heritage. <clears throat> Uh, yes. 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 Um, was the Freedom of Information Act any help at all to you when you were investigating the case and when you were writing your books? No. <laughs> when it comes to, the question was, I don't know if you heard the question, the question was, is the Freedom of Information Act any help when we were doing the research? And the answer was no. The Freedom of Information Act can be used uh, in a number of matters and uh, it is possible to use it. but. When it comes to very, very sensitive cases and issues like this, it's not, it's not uh, useful as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Yes. I think um, from, from John Kennedy to Paul Wellstone, we all sort of know on a gut level who and what is behind all this. Do you think it'll ever reach a critical mass to the point where it all comes out and, and you know, there's really an investigation, and the people who are behind it are really um, taken to task, punished for it. Not absent a revolution. Right. You know, Mr. Jefferson said you need a revolution every 20 years. Yeah. Exactly. Right? You know, and when Jack Kennedy held a meeting in the White House of all the Nobel Prize winners, they had, had them all for dinner one night. He toasted them and he, he welcomed them and he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, never before have so many brilliant minds uh, gathered at this table to dine except when Mr. Jefferson dined alone. Jefferson, with all of uh, 
the imperfections that we, we all carry, um, believed that you had to cleanse uh, a, a government and agents and people in power uh, every 20 years, however you have to do that. Well, of course, we have not uh, done that. There's no sign that we're going to do that. Power has consolidated to a, uh, a point in the United States today uh, where its primary behavioral characteristic is arrogance. And frankly, those are the seeds of, of destruction of any political system when it gets to that point in time. In my lifetime, the media, the control of the media has become so consolidated that it is, uh, uh, it, it's, not, it's not just frightening, it's, it, it's something to lament because there isn't a possibility of getting free and active debate you know, in this, this issue. Um, yes. When you were a journalist in Vietnam, you mentioned the photo, the photographs that were taken. That was the most televised war in history. There were two things that helped the anti-war movement. It was the most televised war in history. You have that classic picture of the little Vietnamese girl naked running in yes. napalm and all the body bags coming back. Yes. Yet during the Persian Gulf War, and afterwards, with almost a half million Iraqi children dying after we blew up their infrastructure, and almost no body bags coming back, and our press have never shown us pictures of the decimation of Baghdad, how do we, we rally against a war with no body bags and no televised destruction of the civilian population? What I find uh, very interesting is that throughout the world today, there is building a movement, an anti-war movement of uh, surprising strength with surprising speed. And, um, and it's almost happening from the roots uh, of, of the soils of, the, of, of, of people who, who know instinctively now what this is all about. Um, it's very difficult to engender this kind of feeling in the United States when the, 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 the drum beats get louder and louder continually throughout the day. Uh, you know. Um, and it's a very difficult task to overcome when you don't have independent, uh, any independent media, when it, transnational corporations control them, uh, bottom lines are important to them. You know, my first book was to have been published by HarperCollins, and they wanted a chapter removed. At the end of the day, everything was clear. They wanted one chapter removed, and, and uh, it, it would have made the killing a king just a mafia killing. But I couldn't do that. Uh, so, well. Some people still think it might have been better to do it and then come back with it later, but I don't think so. It was too integrated. The forces were too integrated. Uh, yes, the lady back there. Did, were you asking a question? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, in your opinion, did he know this was coming? How worried was he for his security? I, I'm sorry. Can you speak a little louder? Um, in your opinion, yeah. how worried was Martin King for his security? And how much do you think he knew that he was at risk and that this might happen to him? Well, I mean, he, you're asking him how prepared he was or how... In he expected to be assassinated. Yes, he expected and he would be killed. He did. A long, years before the, years before He was happened. almost killed many years before when he was doing a book signing in, uh, in Harlem and a woman stabbed him. And, the, and, the, and it just by a, a fraction um, missed uh, uh, an artery that would have killed him. He would have died. So he, but he believed he would be killed. Didn't know when it would come, but he believed uh, he would he would be killed. Precautions by bullets. Not enough. Or anything not like enough. Didn't take precautions uh, about being killed. Didn't take precautions about the wiretapping that was done all the time. Because he said, "Look, I don't mind if they know what they hear what we're saying. We're not doing anything illegal. Let them hear." And what we look at that now and we say, well, "How glorious naivete that is!" Because of course, you're not doing anything illegal, but they, under, they learn your strategy, your movements, they, everything about you. This is the enemy you're dealing with here, right? Well, okay, I, I don't know how much time they're telling me. I don't have too much time. Huh? Two more. Two more. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, I think after the assassination of JFK, he told Coretta that he was going to be killed. He always knew he was going to be killed somewhere along the line, mm. but it seemed almost as if he had a special knowledge at that time. He was planning a treat at Gethsemane with Thomas Merton, many things. He was exhausted, depressed, but I think he knew towards the end that this was going to happen. Well, I think the, the assassination of Malcolm um, moved him more. 
I think uh, that so that was I think a very sobering event for him. Okay, one more question. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question? Oh, I, yeah. All right. Well, let's yeah go with you. You talked about the the military unit in the Pentagon. Where did all that start? Was this an autonomous unit? Somebody had to make the decisions and for the the orders to go. Well, what, what have you learned about that? All right. Try to understand this. Uh, in 1967, 100 cities burned this country. Uh, in autumn of 67, the Pentagon was put under siege. There are 200,000 people at the, at the Pentagon, putting it literally under siege. Um, someone told me that they had a friend who was one of the, and one of the military aides, and he was up on the, on the um, uh, parapet of the Pentagon at, on the day of the demonstration. And there was McNamara and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. No, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs wasn't there. McNamara was there. The chief of staff was there. Assistant chief of staff for intelligence was there. And down the line uh, came the question, starting with McNamara. What do we do about this? They were terrified. These were barbarians at the gates. And the chief of staff shook his head and said, uh, I don't know. Bill, what do we do about this? And he said, Bill said, just give me the go-ahead and I'll take care of this problem. And um, I believe that there was a consensus that Martin King had to go. I, I believe the President of the United States did not know the details of it, but I would be very surprised if he didn't know that it was going to happen because on the 31st of March, he announced four days before the killing that he was not going to run again. So I, I would have thought I would have thought this was well known, and I would have thought today that there's not much doubt that um, people in the know in this country understand what it is that's being covered up and why it's being covered up. And particularly now, it'll be covered up more than ever because now more than ever, government lacking credibility for another war needs all the credibility that it can get. Okay. Okay. Thank you for coming. If anyone is interested in the book, An Act of State, we do have it. Please feel free to come in and ask any more questions. We'll be right in this room. You can come this way, that way, whichever way you like and the book is in the front. Thanks a lot. William Pepper is author of An Act of State, The Execution of Martin Luther King. It's published by Verso on the web at Verso Books.